chapter 2 and John chapter 3. If you don't know, we, are, uh, we started going through Romans and we just finished Romans chapter 1 last week. Uh, in Romans 1, we saw that at the beginning, Paul shared his desire to be with the saints in Rome. <clears throat> Amen. And then uh, Paul tells us that God has, in Romans 1, Paul was telling us that God has written the knowledge of God in the hearts of every single person, man, born, and child that ever lives. And then Paul lays out the progression of sin as you get into Romans chapter 1, the middle towards the end of it, lays out the progression of sin, uh, 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 eventually ending up to reprobate, and not just the wickedness of uh, sex outside the marriage, but specifically condemning same-sex relations, amen, among many others. So the main message of Romans chapter 1 is to the open, the open sinner that is reveling in their sin. That, that's, that's the main context of Romans chapter 1. And here in chapter 2, Paul now directs his attention to the, I put in parentheses in my notes, respectable sinner. The sinner that thinks he or she is better than someone else, also known as the hypocrite. We all know him. We all are him at times. Amen. But understanding that the hypocrite sinner, if you will, is the context here, it should help us understand a little bit better. Also this, I want to preface the next six verses with this. We're only going to get, um, well, we'll get a little past that. But um, verse 1 and 2, we see the judgment against the hypocrite who is guilty in his sins before God. In verse 3, Paul lays out that the hypocrite finds that there is no escaping the judgment of God. We'll see that in verse 3. Verse 4, we see that the hypocrite forgets that the goodness of God leadeth, uh, uh, leadeth to repentance. Verse 5, we see that the hypocrite has, a coming, uh, has coming in his future a hard heart towards God's judgment. So let's start Romans chapter 2, verse 1, and we'll see this. It says, Therefore thou art inexcusable, O man, Whosoever thou art that judgest, for when thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself. For thou that judgest doeth the same things. We are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth against them which commit such things. And thinkest thou this, O man, that judgest them which do such things and doest the same, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God? Or despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance? But after thy hardness and impenitent heart treasurest up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who will render to every man according to his deeds. Brother Shine, would you open this message in a word of prayer, sir? Amen. Verse 6, it says, Who will render to every man according to his deeds? Who will render to every man according to his deeds? God. On the day of judgment. On the day of wrath, if you will. Turn to John 3, 36. You're probably already there. John chapter 3, verse 36, it says, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not on the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. As in, there's a coming wrath, there's a coming judgment day, and it's not going to be pretty if you're not saved. Jump to 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. We'll just turn a few times uh, tonight. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. Miss Darla is excited we're having an afternoon service on the 12th. Because she doesn't have to sneak around. She was already bribing Noah to, um, during the message, to have, to have it playing silently behind me. And nobody would know. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I was being nice. <laughs> Amen. Second Peter chapter 2, verse 9. It says, The Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptations, and to reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment to be punished. 
So first of all, right out of the gate, what, what is God's standard for judgment? I mean, we know these things, but I think we forget these things. What is God's standard for judgment? This. When God judges out of the books, what, what books is he going to judge from? These. These. It's important to know our, the word of God. Amen. We, we take it so lightly. But, but the, the, the standard for God's judgment is his word, not ours. Why does the world want to deny God all the time? Because to accept the God of the Bible is to acknowledge that they're a sinner in need of a Savior. That's not easily done. That goes literally against our flesh. And also because to accept the God of the Bible, you're acknowledging that you need to be in subjection under him if you're intellectually honest. That was a term I used several times this week. Uh, a co-worker of mine uh, uh, came up to me and he said that he, uh, kind of tongue-in-cheek, but he does this all the time, said that he read online that there is a cult that believes that aliens put Jesus on the earth to help mankind and the aliens are mad at people because the people killed Jesus and they're frustrated with man. And he said he really read it and he'll, he'll say things like that and he's always joking around about religion. He's an absolute atheist. Um, um, a little different perspective um, in that he's more justified than the average atheist would be in his mind. The reason I say that is because uh, his dad uh, was like Jehovah's Witness, heavy, uh, Mormon for a while, and then another cult that he didn't know what it was, but it was like um, like paranoid of, you know, the government was going to kill him, so they had to put up metal uh, inside the front walls of his house, so like when the government comes to shoot at him, that they might survive, like crazy, crazy stuff. Um, selling everything they had, just, just, so in his mind, because of religion, well, because of religion, just, it totally turned him away from God. Satan loves that. Right. Satan loves that stuff. Um, so, so he comes up to me telling me that, and, uh, and he's like, well, what do you think about that? I said, well, I said, if you were to be honest with yourself, you know that there's no validity to that. He's like, I know, but it's just their opinion. I said, yeah, but it's more than just opinion. He's like, yeah, but it's their faith. He's trying to get me, right? I said, you know, it's not just faith. I, I, I said, I said, a amen, I, I, it, it takes faith. Without faith, you have to have faith in the supernatural. I said, I can't take Jesus and put him right in front of you and say, hey, here's Jesus Christ. There he is. You know, there's a measure of faith there. I said, uh, but putting that aside, it's not just faith is not the only reason that I'm a Christian. I said, you, let, let's take the, the Christian and the Muslim and the alien cult people and line them up all side by side. And let's, let's, let's put all of the secular and uh, uh, um, religious evidence whether their Bible, whether what their creed is, whatever it is, and historical evidence and secular evidence, put it all together, and let's see what the bigger, bigger pile of evidence shows. I talked about uh, uh, Muhammad. I talked about how they didn't write the Quran until over 150 years after his death, and they attributed all kinds of miracles to things that Muhammad never even claimed. But after the fact, they, they said so and changed things all around. I talked about... This alien cult, I said, you know, there's, if you're honest, intellectually honest with yourself, you know that there's no validity. There's no evidence to that at all. Just somebody saying that, spouting that off. So I said, probably some 13-year-old in his basement, right? I said, but you look at Christianity. Set faith aside. There is mountains upon mountains. I said, you can, you can deny and we can disagree with each other that, that Jesus Christ is the Savior of the world, the Son of God, and, and did all these miracles. I said, you cannot deny all of the, the historical facts of places and people that he saw. They were there. History records it. His enemies recorded it. He was a real person, and people said that he did these things. Eyewitnesses wrote the word of God. I mean, a, a mound of evidence. We could just keep going. So it's not just, it's not just faith alone. There, there's so much more. I said, let me ask you this. I said, how did I say it? I said, if the God of the Bible were true, 
would you become a Christian? And he, he goes, uh, I mean, and we're, it's, it's a nice conversation. It's all, we're not yelling at each other or nothing. It's, it's friendly, right? Uh, but I'm clearly saying how I feel. And he's thinking about it. He's like, well, and I let him think, I mean, like 15 seconds, maybe 20 seconds. And then I just stopped him. I said, see, there you go. You're not being intellectually honest. I said, I'll, t- I'll tell you right now, if I knew that the, the, uh, the, the Muslim God that they call Allah, I said, if, that, if, I, if I knew that was truth, well, I would denounce everything that I ever learned in all my life and studied the word of God. And I would say, hey, I'll bow down to Allah if he is the true God. I said, because I'm being honest with what truth is. I said, the problem is you're not even seeking truth. In fact, I don't even think you care what truth is. You just want to do what you want to do. And, and by you not even acknowledging, if you found out something was true, you'd acknowledge it. That, that, that's sad. And then we started talking about what truth really is. And, I, and he was like, well, truth is all your perspective. I was like, no, it's not. I said, you can have the perspective that two plus two is five all day long, but at the end of the day, it's four. You can have a camp, and you can have a cult, and you can say aliens made uh, a 2 plus 2, 5, but that's just ridiculous because there's a truth. Anyways, we talked about truth for a long time, a perspective, and, and uh, he would not acknowledge at the end of our probably 20-minute, and I brought in another person asking the same thing, and there's three of us. He would not acknowledge that there's a final truth on things. I was like, you're not being honest. I was like, that's cement. That is wood. <laughs> this is black. This, I said, if you can't acknowledge that there's truth, then you're just not being intellectually honest. And now you're literally just trying to justify your own stance so you can win an argument. Amen. Where was that? Let me get off that. Amen. Romans chapter 1. Uh, Paul calls out the sinner in his undeniable and open sin. And in Romans chapter 2, Paul's calling out the hypocrite for judging unrighteously. So that begs the question. If you can judge unrighteously, then how do you judge righteously? Right? Right? So, so look at Matthew chapter 7, verse 1. Matthew chapter 7, verse 1. This is probably the most misquoted. No, no, not misquoted. Um, most taken out of context scripture probably in all the Bible, if I had to guess. It's that Jesus said, judge not that ye be not judged. And I mean... Chapter, book, and verse. There you go. You can't judge nobody, right? Yet he tells us to judge in the next verse, if you keep reading. Let's keep reading verse uh, 2. For with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. And with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. And why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, but considerest not the beam that is in thine own eye? Or how wilt thou say to thy brother, let me pull out the mote out of thine eye, and behold, the beam is in thine own eye? He says, thou hypocrite. First cast out the beam out of thine own eye, then thou shalt see clearly. Cast out the moat out of thy brother's eye. God isn't telling us not to judge. He's telling us how to judge and to make righteous judgment. You say, Pastor Gunther, you just coined that term righteous judgment. No, it's biblical. Turn to John chapter 7, verse 24. John 7, 24. Let's go. We'll go right back to the words of Jesus. John 7, 24. Jesus himself said, judge not according to the appearance But judge righteous judgment. What did God just tell us to do? Judge righteous judgment. Jesus is literally teaching us to get the beam out of our own eye. Amen. Before we get the little toothpick out of somebody else's is what it normally is. And we've all been guilty of that. Amen. Back to our text, Romans chapter 2, verse 1. Romans chapter 2, verse 1. Says, Therefore thou art inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou art that judgest. For wherein thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself. For thou hast uh, judgest. Uh, for thou that judgest doeth the same things. Remember, he's talking about to the hypocrite. Amen. For but but we are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth against them which commit such things. And thinkest thou, O man, essentially, O hypocrite, thou judgest them which do such things, and doest the same, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God. You say, but pastor. You can't judge a book by its cover right. Only God can know the heart. But the cover tells you, the author is trying to tell you what the book is about by the cover. That's why what we dress is important. 
That's why <laughs> we're trying to, sh our heart comes out through our dress. It comes out through our body language. It comes out through our words. Amen. Luke chapter 6, verse 43. Luke chapter 6, verse 43. It says, For a good tree bringeth forth, uh, uh, I'm sorry, for a good tree bringeth not forth corrupt fruit, neither doth a corrupt tree bringeth forth good fruit. For every tree is known by his own fruit. Uh, for of thorns men do not, do not gather figs, nor of a bramble bush gather they grapes. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is good, and an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is evil. For of the abundance of the heart his mouth Speaketh. You don't have to turn there, but Titus 1.15 says, Unto the pure, all things are pure. But unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure, but even their mind and conscience is defiled. You're watching what you ought not to watch. That's what's going to come in your mind all the time. You're speaking things you ought not speak, and you're around people that are speaking things they ought not speak of. That's going to come into your mouth oftentimes. Whatever your mind is dwelling on, that's what comes out. That's why it's so good to be in the Word of God. All of a sudden, you're thinking of godly things. You know, uh, there, there comes a point when um, 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 I, I remember I used to listen to country music on the roof when we do a job. Let me rephrase that. I'd let them play country music on a roof. Whether it was my job or their job, I was usually the one running it, even if I was working for a company. Um, but like, I mean, they, they need music, right? And, and, and they enjoy that. And most of, most of them weren't saved, even though a few of them claimed to be Christians. One was a pastor's uh, uh, son-in-law of a Baptist church, and he listened to awful stuff. Uh, uh, Kid Rock and Eminem and whatever was on 95.5 back in the day. And, uh, and I'm telling you, I'm telling you, at that time in my life, the more I hear it, the more I just didn't, just didn't like it. And when I was younger, I listened to a lot of country. Oh, I like Garth Brooks a lot. He's got a great voice. But man, then, then, then you, you hear a secular song here now and then, whatever. Then like, it just doesn't do what it used to do for you because you're in God's word more. All of a sudden, you just want to hear something more about your Lord. Amen. Where was I? Can we go back to our text and we'll... We'll wind down here. Romans chapter 2, verse 6. Romans chapter 2, verse 6. We'll be done in just a few minutes. Ms. Darla is anxious to get home and get things ready for the Super Bowl. <laughs> Amen. Romans chapter 2, verse 6. Who will render every man according to his deeds? Notice the colon at the end there. You know, it's interesting that we understand how to, like, re not, not that I'm a good... Uh, um, Good at, at, at saying the right words with, uh, what's it called, Rachel? With all the hyphens and stuff to say the words right? Um, say it again? Yeah, we'll go with that. Exactly. You know. But it's important to know some basic, basic things like, you know, a comma and a period and a colon and a semicolon. Because it really, really changes the text if we understand, Right? So the next verse is a continuation of this one. And Paul now divides mankind into two groups. One, verse 7, he divides mankind into the, into the saved. And then uh, verse uh, 8 is the lost. Amen. So look at this. Verse 6 says, who will render to every man according to his deeds. And now it says, verse 7 says, to them who by patient continuance and well-doing seek for glory and honor, immortality, eternal life. He's talking about those who are saved. You're seeking godly things. Verse 8 says, but, uh, but unto them that are contentious and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation and wrath, tribulation and anguish upon every uh, soul of man that doeth evil of the Jew first and also of the Gentile. And then Paul, verse 10, he goes back to clarifying the encouraging point. He says, but glory and honor and peace to every man that worketh good to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. He says, that for there is no respect of persons with God. And you say, that, you say that doesn't make sense. Why did you go back? All, all he's saying is, um, um, we'll be done in less than two minutes. All he's saying is, um, let me illustrate it a different way. 
Um, it's like saying, hey, um, I, I'm, I'm here to help anybody that I can help. And, uh, and everybody that comes, um, everybody that comes on the boat, uh, we'll use the Titanic, everyone that comes on the boat will be saved. Amen. And you, man, you can go home and live and it'll be wonderful. But everyone that stays in the water, you're going to die. The sharks might get you. You're going to drown. You're going to freeze to death. But everyone that comes on the boat is going to be saved. That's what he's doing here. That's why he's going back talking about those who are saved. Then he says, for there's no respect to persons with God. You know, there's no respect to persons with God from the pastor to the parishioner. I'm not crazy about that word, but it's, it's, a, it's a word that works. Amen. It doesn't matter if you're the president or the people of the United States. There's no respect of persons with God. We are all equally sinners. And not everybody agrees with that statement, but that's fine. But we are all equally sinners nonetheless. God's judgment is the same to all men everywhere. That's for all who deny him as their personal savior. But what I'm thankful for, and that's what Paul's getting across here, and then he ends it with, uh, ends it this verse with, just as God's grace is sufficient to all men everywhere for all who accept him as their personal Savior. It's not, the gospel message isn't hard. It's not Paul's personal gospel message. Although he references his gospel several times, people take that the wrong way. But it's the gospel. Oh, it's, it's my gospel. It's Rob's gospel. It's the gospel of Jesus Christ. You ought to take it personally. Amen. Amen. Let's close in a word of prayer. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Lord, I, I pray that we do it justice as we study it.